Hi, I was COVID epidemic simulation curves on my favorite YouTube channel 3 blue one brown and was spellbound with the visuals shown. Post video, I began researching on terms such as flattening of curve, transmission rate, etc. and ended up studying something known as compartment models. I then used my academic research and engineering background to generate curves myself based on those models, at least to a decent extent. Alright, I'm Bharat Madhuri. I will discuss on how to model an epidemic via SIR approach. This is a fundamental basic less dynamic approach to model an epidemic. I shall explain the math in context to India's current COVID-19 data. There are advanced models such as MSIR, SEIR, etc. that capture better epidemic dynamics. These models with probabilistic approaches in conjunction with Monte Carlo and machine learning uh, methods have been published in reputed journals as well. So do check them out. Quick disclaimer, I'm not an expert in any of the below content. I've done this out of interest towards mathematical physics and computational modeling. Apologies for ignorance and technical errors. Let's start by domain with eight people and we shall record general infection spread behavior with respect to time. Let's say on March 1st, the domain records its first infection, therefore active infection IS1. In the domain, there are seven non-infected people that are prone to get infected, also called as susceptibles. The third column stands for recovered people. Obviously, number of recovered cases recorded on very first day will be zero. The assumption here is that there is an homogeneous mix amongst the population. All right, let's march ahead in time and populate the table. On fifth day, the infection spreads to three people. Therefore, I is three. S reduces to five. R remains at zero. On twelfth day, the infection further spreads. But we see the initial infected person to recover completely. Therefore, R is 1, active infections I at 4, S reduces to 3. The general expectation is that through time, recovery starts to onset amongst the infected individuals. As infection further spreads on 28th day, we see recovered subjects to increase. Now, R is at 2, I increases to 5, S reduces to 1. On 27th day, the recoveries increase further. I reduces to 3, S stands at 1. On 31st day, 6 people recover. Active infections reduce now to 1 and S stands at 1. In future, the 8th guy may or may not be infected. Alright, I is active infection subjects, S is susceptible subjects and R is recovered subjects, which includes recovered, removed and dead people together because none of them do contribute to either I or S. Let's visualize the trend of SIR values with respect to time. In S versus T, S starts with a high number and then decays down. For I versus T, the value rapidly increases first and then decays down. For R versus T, the value starts at a very small number, eventually ramps up to a big number. At any given day or time, the summation of SIR is equal to number of people in the domain. Instead of numbers, let's convert the SIR to fractions. That is, we divide each by the domain population. Here, small letters are used to represent the fraction. Also, summation of all fractions is unit population. Now, let's model these behaviors into mathematical equations. Generally, the behavior of any physical phenomena in the universe is best captured through differential equations. They interlink the physical quantity to their rates. For example, Navier-Stokes equation, Newton's law of cooling, convection diffusion equations, or acoustics. All right, ds by dd stands for the rate of change of susceptibles and is directly proportional to interaction between susceptible fraction and infected individuals. Removing the proportionality, we have ds by dt is equal to minus a times s times i. Note the difference in capital and small alphabets. I hope anyone with basic max can figure this out. Minus sign here is to emphasize the decrease of susceptibles with respect to time. A is the transmission or contact weight. Loosely speaking, parameter A gives us information about average number of contacts per person per time. dr by dt is proportional to i as the recovery subjects happen amongst the infected subjects. Removing the proportionality, we have the constant b that gives information on recovery weight or rate amongst i. Let's bring the main equation in scale variable form. Rearranging will give us di by dt. That's it. Let's group all these together. They are now in a coupled form and also these are nothing but system of ordinary differential equations. Here coupled means rate of change of one parameter influences the other, similar to an aircraft's pitch roll and yaw and we need initial conditions to drive our OTEs ahead. In the case studies read so far, I've come across an important number called reproduction number, which is simply the ratio of transmission weight to recovery weight. High disease reproduction number is not desirable. The objective is to have a low RO value. Some questions I asked myself while modeling are A and B random? How do I estimate A and B? Then upon reading journals, I understood that ratio between A and B can be sensed based on the proportionality between recovered and new infections. I did try some curve fitting using LSM and at the end, I simply adjusted A and B values to match all the previously known data. Remember, there is no fixed value of A and B. It is highly variable and changes with respect to time. This is how the plots look when we solve the couple system of ODEs. X axis is time, Y axis is population. It can be percentage or an original number based on the model. The red curve is active infections, the blue is the susceptible subjects, and the green is for the recovered. Let's look at high reproduction number case. First, the active infections rapidly rise, infecting almost 75% of the population in 13 days and then slowly decays down. 
while susceptibles who were at 99% initially reduces to almost 0.01% by 2018 the recovery increases to a large percentage similarly for low ro value the active infections gradually rise infecting just only 25% of populations in 80 days the susceptibles slowly reduce and at the end almost 15% of the population never gets infected at all this is a very very desirable outcome there is an important term called total infections, which is nothing but summation of active infections and recovered cases. The active infection is a red peaky curve and the recovered cases is the green curvy ramp. Addition of the both gives us the total cases, which looks like an inverted S shape in a linear scale. For active infections, the emphasis is always on the peak location in the XY grid. The idea is to have a shorter peak and farther on X axis. Similarly, for total cases, the emphasis is on its exponential growth and terminal flatness. Here is an example of China's total infection data. On linear scale, total infection looks like an inverted S. On logarithmic, it starts like an inclined line and then flattens out. No wonder they say beauty of exponential is best understood in log scale. Let's now look at India's data. Caution, I'm not an expert nor this is my professional background. The method and approach used can be highly incorrect. Alright, this is India's data collected from Worldometer. I used MATLAB to solve the system of ODEs with initial conditions. Using my model, the values of A and B are found for every single day, such that it matches the number of cases. I then took a meaningful average of A and B, that is up to April 5th from my initial condition. Let's look at some results. The first graph here shows the epidemic curves generated with N being 1.37 billion, that is entire population of India. We see that by mid-July, almost 65% of entire India to have active infections, around 20% to remain susceptible while the remaining to be recovered. Caution, the model simply projects the future based on existing meaningful averaged values of A and B. Let's now introduce virtual lockdown into the model, that is, assuming only 0.01% of 1.37 billion to be participants in this game of infection and remaining 99.99% to be in lockdown. Basically, I just reduce the value of N here from 1.37 billion to 1,37,000. We see that by mid-May, 65% of 1,37,000 people to have active infections. This is more desirable as we approach the peak much earlier, but the downside is the height of the peak. Now, imagine a hypothetical situation where P is kept constant and A is reduced by half. That means the disease transmission or contact weight is now reduced to half of what it was earlier. That's quite a significant reduction. This indirectly could be early quarantine of potential vectors and better safety measures that significantly reduce the disease transmission rate within the domain. So with entire Indian population into consideration, we see the peak to appear shorter and has only 20% active infections peaking at an extended time. Let's now try to reduce the players in the game of infection to see if we can get the shorter peak nearer to origin. One way to do it is by introducing virtual lockdown. So once again, lock down 99.99% of population and allow only 0.01% of 1.37 billion to be participants. The curve now peaks much faster and domain shows 20% of active infections within this 0.01% of 1.37 billion and also it peaks at a much shorter time. We also see there is a percentage of people that remain uninfected. Indeed, a very good sign. This is the most desirable outcome any country needs. Having a gradual short peak is desirable because it gives country enough time to implement lockdown strategy, build healthcare and establish logistics. Again, all the above are merely manipulative work and can be incorrect when it comes to numbers. But the intent here is to generate different shapes using our limited model and interpret them for better understanding. The total infection curve in blue is projection for India based on existing average rates of A and B until April 5th. It appears to flatten out only in mid-July. Remember, this considers all 1.37 billions to be players of the infection game. The total infection curve in orange is the current India's trend until April 5th. With effective lockdown, quarantine and better healthcare system, the trajectory will flatten out much earlier than mid July. At the bottom, one can see that if 1.37 billion players are in this game, then curve flattens out by mid July. And if we allow 0.01% of them to be the players in the epidemic game, then it flattens out by mid May. Let's look at some percentages generated by the blue curve previously. By July 2nd week, there are still 32% of Indian population that remain to be infected. Since there is no lockdown behavior model, the disease is bound to spread. So roughly 10 months from March 4th, 0.008% of Indian population still remain uninfected. In this journey, I discovered that there are a few indicators that reveal story of the infection trajectory beforehand. Indicator 1 and 2 are the daily new cases and daily new deaths. One would get an idea about the momentum of infection spread from these indicators. Indicator 3 talks about the newly infected and recovered cases. For desirable outcome, the difference between these two has to approach a minimal value. Indicator 4 
is the actual recovery rate and death rate. For desirable outcome, we need recovery rate to increase and death rate to decrease, basically a divergence between these two curves. All the indicators in conjunction with the MATLAB simulation parameters A, B and reproduction number gives us an idea about the infection spread and its trajectory. And that's how I've done predictions and forecast. Kevin Simler from Melting Haswell built an amazing tool to visualize an epidemic. This was built using advanced SIR compartment models. One can enter the parameters of the city or country and can get a feel about various trends and curves. Do check them out. Based on the above SIR model, these are some predictions and forecasts I shared on my Facebook. Feel free to visit and take a look at them. All explanations are given in detail.